As we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Would you bow with me? Lord, we're thankful for this new day, as we are every new day. We're thankful for the degree of health that enables us to be here. We pray that you would bless us with strength and, and health of mind and body and spirit. And we pray that you bless our work in your kingdom, that we conduct ourselves in a way that, that does indeed bring honor to your name. May we never be a source of embarrassment uh, to the cause. And we pray that you'd bless those that are sick and those that are bereaved. We ask, Father, after two years of struggling with this, uh, this disease that's come among us, uh, for you and your good providence to, to help us. Uh, we pray that our people will be concerned for one another and love each other, and that uh, if we do that, that we will certainly stand out in a world that is dark. Continue with us now. Help us to be the light, to represent the light. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. In chapter 16, beginning at verse 19, we'll read through 31. I just want you to hear it all together. Now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered with sores, and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he carried out, or he cried out, I'm sorry, and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things and likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he is being comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all of this, between us there is a great chasm fixed, so that those who wish to come over here to you uh, will not be able, and that none may cross over from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers in order that he may warn them that they will not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded, even if someone rises from the dead. Uh, in this parable, the Savior uh, illustrates the truth that he had illustrated or that he had given in verse 15. Uh, that which is exalted among men is an abomination uh, in the sight of the Lord. And indeed, that's still true. If you look at the way that um, many in the elite classes are looked up to, the way they conduct themselves, the priorities that they establish, the things that they pursue are offensive to God. It should be offensive to God's people. Uh, during his life on earth, this fellow was an ex a great example of one who was highly esteemed among men. What was that? Well, he was rich. There's a commercial on now with a little girl sitting in a car, some kind of car, and uh, I, she makes the one comment about the owner. She's rich. And then she says, she's rich, rich. Well, that's what a lot of people value is the, the material side of life without very much consideration of that which is spiritual. Of course, that's not saying our people do. But a lot of people that we need to help uh, get reoriented and uh, reprioritize, uh, that's exactly where they are. Uh, after his death, of course, the conditions were, were, um, were reversed. I mean, it didn't matter how much esteem he was held in by men, the way that he pursued his life was offensive to the Lord. He was selfish. Uh, and there's nothing in the parable that I can read that says he ever mistreated Lazarus in any way or that he spoke to him in an unkind manner. He just wasn't aware. He just, having a high old time, 
oblivious to the suffering that was around him. And uh, there again, that's, that's kind of an indictment because you can find that. You know, there are people that don't know that there are good many folks living under bridges in Livingston. And if you, if you want, don't believe me, go down there and try to wet your line and wet your hook uh, under one of those bridges. And there's folks up under there, and a lot of them are mental patients. A lot of them got drug problems and what have you. Um, and uh, it just, uh, there's a little woman that's sitting down here right across from CVS, and I don't really know how to help her. She, it happens that she's black, but she's obviously mentally ill, just sitting down there with her stuff piled up. And, um, you know, there's not really a reason for that in the richest country in the world. Uh, nevertheless, there it is. And uh, it's a sad sight to observe. Uh, but people going and coming, of course, why? Well, they're busy. I, I get that. A lot of things going on. Uh, but that person is suffering. Um, I, well, I won't tell that story. Um, but at any rate... After his death, there's this re reversal that takes place because of the selfishness with which he's conducted himself in this life. There wasn't anything wrong with him being a rich man, was there? I mean, that was not wrong. Nothing wrong about that. Apparently he was intelligent. He might have made wise investments and what have you. Stuff paid off. That's good. That's good. That's all good. But it's what you do with the opportunities that you have. You know, some of the most covetous people I've ever been around weren't rich people. And so that can go both ways. But in this case, he's talking about, and, and he's talking here, the Pharisees are listening. Even when he's talking to his disciples, the Pharisees are about, hanging around listening. They were money grubbers. They loved opulence and wealth and what have you. Uh, the rich man here is, in verse 19 is clothed with royal type robes, constantly giving splendid banquets and celebrations of, uh, with splendor and pomp and extravagance and all of those kinds of things. And everybody's ooing and eyeing and what have you. In the meantime, you've got a guy down here by the gate that's just hoping that he'll get some crumbs and uh, nobody pays any attention to him except the dogs. Uh, he strives... Uh, this rich man strives after no higher purpose in his life than to use his riches in selfish things, in ostentation and uh, worldly pleasures. Uh, you know, you, you wonder about, or I wonder about, fellas building rockets um, to just go up in, in space. I guess if they earn the money, they can do that. But it, uh, when you got so many people suffering so much, I wonder about that. I mean, j just to just to be a tourist, I guess. But someday, maybe that'll happen. And we'll all get a chance to go and it'll be reasonably priced and all that. But this man is oblivious to the need within his community. And he just doing his thing, having a big time. And so he doesn't have an eye of sympathy on display at all. Uh, and, and, and he's not concerned about the needs or the sufferings of others, but has fallen completely into self-seeking and, and pleasure uh, of this world. And when I go down south, I remember being um, in Lima, and Rodolfo pointed out to me, he said, that's, where, that's the richest man in, in Peru right there. That's where his house is. Well, all you could see was a 20 or 30, it looked like a Walls unit over at Huntsville, and it means he's got his own army. Uh, they've got towers on that thing. It looks like a medieval thing, except it's way bigger than any medieval castle. I don't know anything about the man, uh, but you wonder about it, you know. Uh, and uh, same thing in a lot of those little countries like that. There's, there's people there that are just fabulously wealthy, but it's hard for a, a working man, honest guy, to just get a living. Um, and uh, you'll see people uh, in San Salvador digging in the trash for stuff to eat. Uh, and there again, you know, we, when we went down in that country, that volcanic soil, there's no reason for anybody to be hungry. I mean, it, it stuff come up if you put seed on the ground. But it's, it's the way the system's set up, and there's a few that's got it all. So, I, you know, you can identify 
with that a little bit, particularly if you get out and just get out and look around. And this sick beggar's out there by his gate, and he's sick, and he stays sick, and he's uncared for, and he's laying there in misery. And in vain uh, did the starving Lazarus long uh, to deal with the, his cravings of hunger, apparently, from what fell from that man's table. That's why it was there. He had hopes that they would, I guess some of the people did that, but this guy didn't. And so he dies in that wretched state. And this, this rich man, heartless, left him there. Left him there hungry, unaided. And only the dogs took an interest in him. Well, do we have any responsibility, see, you know, the, Jesus is trying to teach Pharisees something, but he's trying to teach us something too. Do we have a responsibility? And, and of course, I think fortunately our, our people, our country, has through the years, I, and I, and I don't think I know, been one of the most generous places at all because of Christian teaching. And there's a lot, lot, lot that goes uh, in the direction of some of the places I've talked about. Uh, we have brethren that go down and do medical missions in Central America. Not just our brethren, but there are a lot of other people that do as well. Uh, there are uh, different specialists that come down and donate their time and what have you. And so we're, we're happy about that. But then you do have that class of folks that are not concerned. And, and where I worry about it more, not worry about it, but I'm concerned about it, is, is we make sure as God's people that we don't follow their example. And uh, we hadn't done that, uh, but we don't want to start either. Uh, we don't want to allow uh, this to take place in our community. Finally, the beggar dies, and no doubt hunger and deprivation uh, has contributed a great deal to that. And, and so he dies, and but he's not a... An embittered man. You don't see him uttering a word or charging God with any kind of crime. You know, sometimes people, when they suffer, particularly if they're suffering unjustly as near as they can tell, they get embittered toward the Lord, don't they? Or toward the Lord's people. And um, he didn't, you don't see that about this man. Um, and so when he leaves this world, he's transported by angels. That's one of their assignments. And he's transported by angels into a place of, of blessedness when he dies. The rich man, like the sick beggar, also dies. But it's a very different outcome, isn't it? How much influence did his wealth, his material wealth, have on his status after he crossed the, the river? So. And then you go back to the parable he told previously. There are people, this, this unjust steward, remember him? He was, oh boy, he was all about setting stuff up from the here and now. But you can't stay here, can you? You can't stay here. Your, you know, your hair turns white or falls out or both. You know, and uh, Solomon talks about the grinders, the teeth, they go away on a lot of people. And these uh, inevitable uh, cost that physical aging impose on us are just, that's the same for everybody. And it doesn't matter how big a stash of cash you got. And so it has no influence whatsoever. And in the hereafter, his status, owing to the selfishness with which he had lived in the here and now, and just the heartlessness, he's just reverse from what he knew on earth. While Lazarus enjoys the full blessedness of being with uh, Abraham, the father of the faithful, who during his life, that is Lazarus' life, was despised and neglected as a beggar. Uh, he apparently had health problems, couldn't get out and get a living. They didn't have government programs like, like we do. There wasn't anybody to help him, nobody to appeal to. And so he just suffered till he died. And pretty much nobody cared, especially not this individual, as Jesus tells the story, setting up a contrast. And of course, he's, what he's doing is trying to get the religious leadership of, of Israel to think about the way they're conducting their lives. 
You remember um, when uh, he tells a story about uh, about some of them, uh, you know, when their old parents, aged parents, appealed to them for help, they said what? I've got that dedicated. I can't give it to you. I'm, I'm going to give that to God. In other words, when I die, that goes to the Lord, but I can't help you now. And that was just a, a dodge to go around the law because in Israel, uh, the way the Lord had set it up, families took care of their own. And, you know, that used to be that way here. You might have uh, some people, they didn't live as long, but, you know, grandma and grandpa at some point, they'd be sitting on the front porch and everybody would go to the field and work and they'd drink tea or lemonade or whatever and, uh, and sit in the shade. And uh, until they pass from this life, um, you know, my I had relatives that, that that's exactly what happened. And so we got to be around and see the, the generation that came before us. But this rich man, uh, while he was here, regards himself as totally independent and had, you know, on account of his wealth and all of that, he didn't ever have to ask anybody for anything in this life. But when he gets into the Hayden realm, uh, he's having to ask for some help. And he's finding out what it's like to, to have to beg because you have no resources. And what he asked for is just, just let Lazarus dip his finger into the cool water and cool my tongue. And this, uh, this flame of remorse that I'm in, this, this inexpress, uh, uh, inexpressible despair that I've entered into. And uh, Abraham answers that, that no can do. There's a great distance uh, between us and nobody can cross it because God's established that rule now. You read some of the commentators and they go all over the place. Well, they'll say, well, this, this is a parable, therefore it's not real individuals. Well, I don't know that you can make that. Well, this is uh, highly unusual for Jesus to use a name. But he uses the name Lazarus, and who's he going to heal in a few days, a little, little while down the road? A fellow named Lazarus. So I, I don't know that he don't know now what he's going to do then. And uh, I don't make any uh, judgments about whether or not it's like really real or it's a parable. He told the truth, whatever it was, doesn't he? And what he describes is about the truth. Now, the parable is not given primarily to answer all our questions about the intermediate state of the dead where people wait on the, on the final judgment. Uh, but he does answer some questions. But his, his primary thing is to talk to us about how we, how we use the resources that, that come to us and how we look upon other people uh, that we're around from day to day. Well, uh, now this man uh, is the beggar, and he's yearning for somebody to give him some help and some relief, and Abraham says, we, we can't do that. And he points out to him that this reversal is the result of the decisions that you made. See, if I don't make it uh, to heaven, whose fault is that going, who's that going to be on? That's going to be on me, because I've had all kinds of opportunities. It's not, it's not my mom and daddy's fault, and it's not my teacher's fault, or on and on and on. That'll be because of the decisions I made or I didn't make. Uh, and uh, Abraham says, you know, you, son, you lived a heartless kind of a life, wholly uh, consumed in worldly pleasure and luxury. That's your highest goal, and uh, you've reveled in that and completely trusted in those things. Um, in, um, it, it's, uh, I remember distinctly one time down at the Buddha Belly Bench that used to be down here in town, and uh, I was allowed to sit down there and drink coffee with those sages and philosophers, and they all had a Buddha Belly, except me. And uh, they would sit down there and pontificate on the world, and like every little town's got that kind of a clatch, coffee clatch, but uh, uh, there was a fellow one time down there just, just bragging about, well, he was a prepper and he had so many gallons of gas and so many gallons of diesel and he had enough food to last 100 years and, and he'd just go on and on and on. And then there was a fellow that was a Shaolin priest 
who was a, a grandmaster. And he's sitting there listening to that, and he said, fella, you don't need to be telling that kind of stuff. Well, why not? And he said, well, because I've been hungry, and I'm not going to be hungry again. He's been former Green Beret in American military, and he said, I'm not ever going to be hungry again, and I know where all your stuff is. And he said, now, I'm not going to come over there and harm you, but there are a lot of people that would. And my, the point, the reason I tell that, can you trust on the things of this world? Can you put your trust in that? See, if God brings you know you into a place where you have more than you need and you got the opportunity to do good, great. But do not put your trust in that, in the material thing, in the material wealth. Use it for good while you got it. Because if you, if you read history, there's just been too many occasions where the government changed and what happened? They redistributed the wealth. You can translate that. They put it in their pocket. And took it away from the people that made it. And so I don't want to, I just don't want to put all my trust in something that is material. Should we work and provide for our own and try to provide for our advanced years? Oh, of course. And he's not knocking that, but he said, don't put all your trust in that. Trust God and be about his business. Um, this man now has become the beggar. He's steeped in suffering and, and during his life. He regards those worldly possessions as his own. You know, I've said lots of times before, you, you and I and all of us, we drove down here in the Lord's car, we're sitting in the Lord's building, using the Lord's air conditioning, wearing his clothes, going to eat his food uh, for dinner. Uh, well, I don't know if you want to go to town and eat in somebody's place. I don't know if that's whose that is. <laughs> I don't know if he'd claim it. But, you know, the, the resources that we have, he's let us have. And he's been awful kind to us, and we, we thank him for that. And I hear people pray, and they do. Um, and, and that is good. But we ought to, to make sure that we don't just live for the sake of our own ease and pleasure, and that we don't just regard uh, the things that we have as ours, but be, also be concerned about the community where we live and the people that are around us. Um, so, so he has chosen this man as, as, as his focus, this earthly portion, and it's led him to this pitiable state, awful suffering. Uh, he, had not made, uh, he had not made friends uh, with the use of the mammon among righteousness, as he talked about in the previous parable. He had not used that in a way that was going to advance him or help him when he crossed across uh, of the river of death. And so, on the other hand, you see Lazarus there, who was, of course, doing without, but now he's with Father Abraham. One brother, uh, Brother Kaufman, and I have a lot of regard for him, Brother Burton Kaufman, but he just thinks uh, that there's no way that said that that that, that Abraham in the parable represents God because God determines what happens with souls, which, of course, is true. But that means Abraham couldn't be Abraham. That means God. And I thought, well, I don't know. Why didn't you say that? Why can't he be? Why couldn't God assign Abraham a job? Is it against the rule somewhere for Abraham to have a job? If he's the father of all the faithful, uh, would it be, you know, I... I it, I, it's not an argument really worth having, but I just thought it was odd that he, that somebody would respond to it in that way. I like to read these parables, and I know they are are parables, but I still like to read it as straight as I can read it, and not start trying to pick the thing apart and pump some meanings in here and there that that are not obvious from reading it. Just read it straight. And when you read the story straight, you got a rich man and a poor man, a poor man named Lazarus and Abraham involved in this, this interaction. Um, when the rich man finally realizes that, that he has sealed his own fate, he does show for the first time some regard for other people because he asked Abraham if somebody couldn't go back from the dead and talk to his brothers and, and dissuade them and persuade them that whatever they do, don't come here. And, um, you know, it's, he's not my, my physical brother, but I'm going to try to learn from what he said, and I, I believe him. I believe that we don't want to go where he is. But he says, please send him back. And, and, you know, Abraham, of course, answers 
that they don't have an excuse. Your brothers that are on earth have no excuse to be impenitent. Why not? Well, because they've got the law and the prophets. Uh, God's gone to a lot of trouble to have his servants record what he's recorded and to have that preserved in, throughout history. You know, there have been people, that, a lot of people that have given their lives in preserving the scriptures and putting the scriptures together. Uh, if you go back and you can study a lot of that in history, uh, it's been a great cost to bring this book to us that we all have. And, and so he says it, that, and of course Moses, uh, where he presents it at the time, Moses and the prophets are, are operative, you know. But I think more likely he's referring to the scrolls. They've got that. God's been clear. He, is, God can, can uh, communicate pretty effectively, can he? with his own creatures, do this, don't do that. And, and so it's just straightforward, not complicated unless you make it complicated. And, and so now, now uh, he wants somebody to send them back. And, you know, if they listen, Abraham says, if they'll listen to Moses, the prophets, they'll know how to conduct their lives. They'll know what they need to do. And, and um, so, they, of course, the wish is not granted. The request is not granted. Uh, they have no excuse uh, for having um, come to the place where they are, and nor does he. Uh, the law and the prophets will show them the way if they're willing to listen. Uh, the rich man in verse 30 reveals the typical attitude of the Jews repeatedly asking for signs so astounding as to compel them to believe. He says if, if that, if, uh, that if Lazarus were to go back from the dead, that his brothers would be convinced. And, of course, that's not true. Abraham answers that if they are so full of unbelief and so full of worldly mindedness that they do not listen to the words of God, then they will persist in unbelief even if someone rises from the dead. Now, he's forecasting. Who's about to go to Jerusalem and be crucified and rise from the dead on the third day? Jesus. And how many of the Jewish religious leadership believed on him? Not many, did they? Some did, but not many. So he knows what's going, what's happening. It's in place. It's on, uh, coming to a, a, a fruition real fast. And, and so, presents Abraham here uh, saying that they're not going to listen. If they won't listen to the law and the prophets, you think somebody coming back from the dead is going to move them? It won't do it. They'll, they'll do what they did. We're going to look at that today, what they did when Jesus did come. And, uh, you know, they got all kinds of, of things to try to explain away what, was, what their eyes are telling them. And the events that actually took place abundantly prove that what has been said about Messiah, and they don't accept him. The Savior related this parable, uh, like I said earlier, not in order to satisfy human curiosity about death and about what takes place while we await the, the resurrection, but he, is, he is, is there to emphasize very vividly the seriousness of life on this side of the grave. It's, you know, what we do here and the choices that we make and the goals that we pursue and all, that's important. Uh, it's vital. Why is it vital? Because it's going to have everything to do with where we find ourselves in eternity. And so he's urging people to make the right choices. And however wealthy, and honored a, a man may outwardly be, however much his life may be filled with worldly pleasure, uh, this will not in eternity be able to affect in the slightest the disposition of his soul on the part of our Lord. It'll be whether or not he heard God's word. At that time, it was Moses and the prophets. For us, it's the new covenant. And Moses and the prophets, you know, we have we have more than they had, but that's that's going to be the determining factor. 
That's just so obvious, and yet, how many people live that way? Yes, Brother Herschel. How many times in your preaching career have you heard somebody say, well, that preacher is full of concerning these things, no one in your heart that they're probably wanting to listen to? I've lost count. Good point. First, so how many times have you as a preacher admonished people when you did a funeral? He's done funerals. Uh, admonished the ones that are left along these very lines. No one, they're probably not going to listen. You know, you'll have the, the, the prodigal in the family who's out there blowing and going, having a high old time, you know, and uh, waste, like, the, like the, the son that went and wasted all of his his father's goods on wine, women, and song, you know, and they keep right on. But Joe? Similar thought, people have made the statement, if Jesus was here today, we would believe him. But even in his day, there was a lot of people believed, but there was a lot of disbelief, even though he did miracles. So just having the presence of someone doesn't mean anything. If Human beings have an incredible capacity to ignore and deny what's in front of them. You know, if, if, if they've committed to a course of action and they're not going to listen, then you get pretty quickly to a point where it's pointless to talk about it because they're not going to do it. Um, I remember my Uncle Thomas he said when he first started practicing medicine, he thought everybody wanted to get well. <laughs> What a naive view. He said, human beings do not want to hurt. They're not worried about getting well until they get to the terminal point, you know. And, um, and so, because he used to expend a lot of time and energy and said, and now when I figure out a person is not going to listen to me, I do what I can to alleviate what suffering I can. But, you know, I don't spend a whole lot of time worrying about it because it doesn't do me any good or, or them any good. Well, you can, you, that was in the physical realm. But it is the very same principle in the spiritual realm. And, and so if I knew how, I wish I did know how to persuade people of the need to take seriously this life. You know, it's fleeting. Most of us in here are old enough to know it's fleeting and that we don't stay here long. And, and so the time we're going to spend in, in, the, uh, in eternity, what we call eternity, where time and space apparently are, are much changed or, or non-existent, uh, is a lot longer than, than we stayed here. And uh, nevertheless, this is a, a preparatory time that we have. And so uh, no matter what comes to a man here, when he departs from this life, he's got to judge, be faced uh, the Lord. And what's going to be the basis of judgment when we face him? Yeah. John 12 and verse 48, the words I have spoken, what? The same shall judge you in the last day. So I've spoken with clarity, told you how to conduct yourself, what to avoid, what to, what to embrace and what to do. And so you've got it. And he's very clear in that, now I'm going to tell you straight up, that when I get there, that I'm going to call a judgment. And it's going to be those rules. Uh, we see today uh, the terrible problem with crime and what have you in our cities and, and, and all, because people don't have the concept that there are rules until they get before a judge, and then they find out, oops, Maybe there are, you know. And, and so they impose the penalty that the law requires, and, and it's, you know, it's sad. It's, it's sad to watch somebody. Uh, I was with Brother Thompson when he, he got sentenced to prison. He killed four people. Uh, but it's still sad to see a guy that should have been, you know, going fishing at the lake and, and uh, you know, kind of coasting on out because he didn't have long to live anyway, going to the pen. But who made the choices that he made? 
He made the choices. And sad as that was, I, I'm not a bit mad at the judge, or, uh, Judge Trapp or, or the sheriff at the time it was Billy Ray and, and or any of those people because he took the decision. And he did have me tell you that. Um, and so there we are with a familiar passage, and, and we want to learn the lesson of the parable. Here I want to stress does not teach that uh, worldly goods are bad, in and of themselves. I want to restress that. It's what you do with them and how you how you use them. And a life of poverty uh, doesn't necessarily mean that one is uh, morally superior, does it? You know, I've, I mean, I've seen and dealt with petty thieves that, you know, they, they won't work. And so they just try to get around and, and scrounge around and, and uh, just throw their lives away, uh, could have been productive. They finally get to a point that, that they no longer have the ability to do that. But everything depends with relative, uh, relative to our possessions, to our attitude toward them and how we, how we use those things. And whether one believes in God and has a penitent heart and serves him, whatever his eternal circum, uh, external circumstances may be, uh, whether he rejects uh, the Lord, you know, all of that can be done in poverty or wealth, can't they? Uh, I remember one night of uh, being in El Salvador, and we got a call that one of the old brothers was sick, old gentleman, 92 years old. And I mean, he was, he was sick. Turned out he'd gotten food poisoning. But we went over there to see about him. And I, t I promise you that when my son had uh, lambs, that the shed that they stayed in was better than what that guy had. You know, he had a, a little old hovel that he was in, and it had a one chair and a one bucket at a little table. And Bible in the middle of the table, and his other suit of clothes hung up. And he was trying to wear, he was sick. But anyway, but he did good with it, and he was a faithful man. You know, I don't know how came how he came to be quite as destitute as he was, but he'd lived in faith. And uh, and I have no reason to doubt that he didn't go on to the Lord and, and receive his reward because of the attitude that he had. Uh, we got him some medicine one day that night, went by, to, took the doctor with us to check on him the next morning, and he come out like that, and he went, you know, he, uh, it was amazing the uh, effect that medicine had on that, that man at all, but he was... He was up and going and happy and jolly and thanked us for uh, getting him a little bit of medicine and what have you. And, uh, and on down the road he went. But the thing was, he didn't have much, but his attitude was good. He's a happy man. He was a fulfilled man in many ways. In chapter 17, verses 1 through 10, uh, Jesus says some thing, uh, has some sayings here that kind of tie uh, what he's been talking about together. He said to his disciples, it is inevitable that the stumbling blocks come, but woe to him through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he would cause one of these little ones to stumble. Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, forgive him. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith like a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Which of you, having a slave, plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he has come in from the field, come immediately and sit down to eat? But will he not say to him, prepare something for me to eat and properly clothe yourself and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you may eat and drink? He does not thank the slave because he did the things which he was commanded, does he? So you too, when you do all the things that you are commanded, you say, we are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. Uh, a lot of Bible uh, scholars view these few verses 
as a number of loose sayings of the Savior uh, that lit recorded with no connection to anything else. I think that incorrect. Uh, it appears that the, to me that there's a unity between the various pronouncements and that although Luke does not expressly say so, they're uttered on one and the same occasion. But that's my opinion. Uh, verses 1 and 2, the Savior here addresses the disciples expressly and warns them, take heed to yourselves against the danger that their example and their words and their attitudes, their neglect of duty, if they neglect their duty, would do spiritual harm to others, especially the weaker ones of the disciples. You know, Among his disciples are former publicans. There are uh, outcast sinners that have turned to the Lord, uh, kind of a rough bunch, and they're trying to get, get them you know, in a place where they need to be. And so he's saying to these closest associates of his, you, be, you better be careful, and I want you to be very careful about your own example around these little ones, as he called them, these that are they're getting started. And that should be an incentive, shouldn't it, to us? Blessed as we've been and the opportunities that we've had and, and uh, places uh, where some of us are allowed to serve, that we want to be very careful about the way we impact those around us. And so he's letting them know that now I'm going to hold you, do, you boys to account. And uh, so terrible will be the punishment to be undergone by the one that causes offense to one of these little ones that Jesus said it'd be better if you died suddenly than to enter into eternity having done that. It'd be better if somebody tied a millstone around your neck and threw you in the ocean. Well, that's, that's a dramatic way of saying drowned you because you're not going to recover from that, a violent death. And so uh, he, the, the person that was thrown into the ocean like that would have at least escaped the sin that he's potentially going to commit and the punishments that's going to follow that is much more severe than losing your life. That's his point that it'd be better to lose your life in a violent crime than to go on and commit this offense, this kind of offense, and enter into eternity with that uh, debited to your account, if you will. And so he points out so clearly the criminality involved, the level of criminality involved in causing somebody else to fall into sin through one's life, through one's attitude, through uh, the way that one speaks to others. And, and those who have allowed themselves to be so influenced, do not bear less responsibility. He's not saying that, but he's saying, I'm, I'm going to bring you in and hold you accountable if you do that. Uh, that's why we're told, for example, be not many teachers. Why? There are going to be stricter judgment. If you get up and propose to teach other people and then you don't do it, you teach them wrong, you mislead them, or you don't do what you say and make them think, well, we don't really have to do that. We just say that. That's not the way it is, the Lord's saying. Uh, certainly, I will expect you to be, you know, to be straight and honest. I remember one time, I can't remember who the brother was, but one of our brothers was, uh, and he was a Scotsman, but he was speeding. He had a ticket uh, on Carmonic Road in Glasgow, Scotland. And he came before the magistrate, and he said, then what do you do, sir? And he said, I'm a gospel preacher. And he, <laughs> an old judge looked at him and, and assessed the maximum fine for traffic violation and said, you, of all people, should know better. Well, was that right? That was exactly right. And, and the judge was right. And, of course, the brother paid the fine. He didn't, he didn't boo-hoo and whine about it. I mean, he just did it and knew he did it. And uh, but that's that's kind of way the Scots are anyway, and and so he held him to account, and and that's exactly what Jesus is saying here, uh, verses three and four, just as it's necessary for the disciples not to put obstructions in the way of others, so it's necessary for them to be forgiving towards those who commit offenses to, against them. You know, um, that's a hard one, isn't it? Uh, you know, there it would depend on where you came from and, and what kind of raising you had and all that. There are people that, that would rather just smack them around a little bit, straighten them up. But that's not what he says to do, does he? He doesn't, he doesn't put coercion in, uh, say, in my toolkit. 
I don't have any right to try to coerce anybody into obeying the gospel. If I can't convince them with the gospel, then, then they're just not going to be convinced, at least not by me, if they, if they reject the evidence I try to put before them. But I, I can't coerce them. I don't have permission to coerce them. A police officer that's wearing a badge, and he's got, if he carries one, a taser on one side and a pistol on the other, he's got the power and the right to coerce people. You either do it or, or you know, he's just going to thump you. And, but nobody else has that right. We, we restrict that, and rightly so. Um, and so he tells them, now, you, you want to be forgiving towards others. And uh, their, their forgiveness is not weakness. Why is that? Well, because he doesn't say just forgive them and, and no consequences for the sin they committed, did he? What did he say do? He said, you rebuke him. And you, then you forgive him. You point out to him where he's in error and urge him to correct that. See, so it's not, it's, it's you know, don't, don't go slander him behind his back. You tell him what the infraction is and what he did wrong. And then forgive him. And um, I, people read over that a lot of times. The disciples of Christ should always uh, be without inward rancor and lovelessness, and they should be forgiving, but they also should be people that will speak the truth when somebody has committed an error. Um, I remember that old judge whenever he sentenced Brother Floyd, you know, and I, I mean, he was a, just as polite and all to Floyd, and he knew how sad the situation was and all of that, and when he sentenced him, he said, I, I wish you good luck and all of that, but he imposed the penalty. So he, he admonished him uh, about what had taken place and said, I, in other words, basically, I've got to, I've got to impose this. Because well, you can't just go around uh, taking actions like that. And so there should be no limits, Jesus is pointing out, to the forgiveness towards those who are actually penitent. Um, if, if Do people always get it right the first time they try to correct? Say so repentance is a lot of times it's a process. It takes somebody more than one try. And Jesus is saying, let's let them have more than one try, particularly if they're trying to do the right thing. If, if somebody's trying to repent, what ought we to do? Let them, huh? If they want to repent and turn, let them do it. Um, sometimes folks, at least I get the impression they want somebody to, Put some glass shards here down the center round, make them crawl down there on that glass, you know, and, and eat a bucket of dirt when they get down here, and then we might let them repent. No, 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 no. And that's extreme, and it's said to, to indicate we all know better than that, don't we? He says, if he turns seven times in a day and is penitent, forgive him. Thank you for being here today. God bless you.